morning, everybody. I'm happy to be here today. Thank you, Dean Carr, for this opportunity to, to speak here about something I'm very passionate about, about American Roots music. And uh, I will talk about three women who are changing this kind of music from the inside out. One woman is called Rihanna Giddens, <clears throat> Amethyst Kia is the other one, and Sierra Hall. And they have all contributed in their own way to significant change in bluegrass and Americana music. Rihanna Giddens was born in 1977 in Greensboro, North Carolina, and she is of European American descent on her father's side and of Native American descent on her mother's side. She studied classical voice at Oberlin College, but she's best known for her work as a member of the band Carolina Chocolate Drops and her subsequent solo work. She's a Grammy winner, and she was named a MacArthur Fellow in 2017. Giddens' instruments of choice are the gutstring minstrel banjo that you can see in this photo up here, which is a distinctly African version of the instrument, and the fiddle. Her knowledge of Appalachian, early African-American, and classical music allows her to combine all these styles in a really cool, nuanced way. Amethyst Kia is the lady in the, on the bottom left here, was born in Chattanooga, Tennessee in 1986. Uh, she's an African-American queer singer-songwriter who lives in Johnson City, Tennessee. She graduated from the Bluegrass Old Time and Country Music Program at East Tennessee State University. And together with Rihanna Giddens, she formed the band Our Native Daughters that released a self-titled album in 2019 and that was nominated for a Grammy. And Sierra Hull, the third lady here, was born in 1991 in Birdstown, Tennessee. Birdstown is in Pickett County. It's classified as at risk by the Appalachian Regional Commission. And that means that 15.6% of the population of that county are living beyond, below the national poverty line. Hull started performing on the Grand Ole Opry when she was 11 years old. She's been nominated for two Grammys and she is the first female recipient of the Mandolin Player of the Year Award by the International Bluegrass Music Association. She's won that three years running, actually just uh, for the third time last week. And uh, Sierra received a presidential scholarship to attend Berklee College of Music under the Obama administration. In her lyrics, she explores her background and her desire to push ahead while maintaining a connection, a tight connection to her Appalachian roots. This study that I'm presenting today is about uh, half as long as the written version of this study. And I hope that it will show you how these women as songwriters have shattered glass ceilings in male dominated styles of music. I'm an instructor in the songwriting department. So I think I have uh, some hopefully interesting things to say about this. Amethyst Kia and Rihanna Giddens stand out as artists that are bringing in a new era by interpreting their traditions informed by their academic background and their cultural heritage. And Sierra Hall presents important insights into the life of a young Southern white woman from a rural background who's a role model for young women in bluegrass. And in this study, I will highlight my thesis that innovation requires preservation, a topic that I'm also exploring at a, as a graduate student at ETSU myself. And I'm going to highlight how these three women are helping to create a new reality by using their diverse cultural backgrounds as assets. Uh, this, this study will mainly focus on the songwriting aspect, not the performance aspect of Giddens, Kia, and Hall. And al although I'm a, a white male, I think the point could be made that I'm a, a member of a minority group as well because I'm a first generation immigrant. Um, actually, it's kind of funny. Uh, October 6, 19 years ago, so today, 19 years ago, I moved to the United States um, full time, if you want to call it that. And as a songwriter, as an active songwriter, I'm also an active contributor to the world of bluegrass and Americana music, which I think gives me a distinct viewpoint from which to explore the contributions of other minorities to these musical genres. So I think what we need to do is uh, we need to start def to define a couple of terms that we'll talk about. The first term that I want to talk about is old time music. Old time music is a form of North American folk music with roots in England, Scotland, and Ireland, as well as the continent of Africa. It's played on acoustic instruments, generally centering on a combination of fiddle, mandolin, guitar, and banjo. 
Merriam-Webster defines Americana music as, quote, a genre of American music having roots in early folk and country music. Bluegrass music, the birth of bluegrass music is attributed to the gentleman on the left. His name was Bill Monroe and his band from 1945 when they played at the Ryman Auditorium here in Nashville. But of course, music, no music is ever born in the vacuum of one moment. And so it was with Bill Monroe's bluegrass music. His music was a blend of influences uh, consisting of old time Scots-Irish fiddle tunes, but also of the blues influence playing of an African-American man who had a German name. His name was Arnold Schultz, who was one of, the Mon of Monroe's early mentors. And we can see him on the right. Together they would play dances in local Kentucky in the 20s and 30s. And Bill Monroe combined these two strands of music into this really fast, precise, rhythmic, and sometimes mournful music that we know as bluegrass music today. The instrumentation of his band was mandolin, guitar, fiddle, banjo, and upright, upright bass, just like the old string bands. And so we can see now that old time music was a direct, direct precursor to bluegrass music, and that both live under the umbrella of Americana music. Black string bands were extremely popular in America between 1900 and 1930. You see two black string bands here. A typical string band would also consist of the banjo, the fiddle, the mandolin, and sometimes a cello, actually, or an upright bass, and often, but not always, a guitar. The guitar uh, became important in American folk music a little later. Um, JJ writes that, quote, fiddling was pervasive for entertainment at family and other social gatherings in many African-American communities between the 17th and 19th centuries, so for a long time. And the fiddle continued to be an important instrument in early 20th century blues and jazz bands. So how is it then that today we know so little about these black string bands? The answer is a little bit complicated because it involves several hundred years of misrepresentation of the violin or the fiddle in the African-American context. And it will require a little bit of an ethnomusicological, ethnomusicological detour to explain this. But the answer will feed directly into, directly into the importance of the work of Rihanna Giddens and Amethyst Kia. So allow me please to take this little musical detour. On the left here, we see a bowed lute. The bowed lute is an instrument that was played in many different cultures before it developed into the violin that we know today, which we see on the right. Chinese, Arabic, European, and West African people all had their version of the unfretted bowed lute. According to JJ, several West African tribes used their bowed lutes to, quote, call the spirits in religious worship and a symbol of political authority and ethnic identity. And so from these quotes, we can already see how important the bowed lute and its future relative, the violin, would be when we think about terms such as political authority and ethnic identity. Enslaved people used the bowed lute and another instrument, the banjar, to play music on the slave ships so people could move around. On the slave ships and later in America, the use of the drum was prohibited since the enslavers saw it as an instrument that could potentially induce revolt among enslaved people. And so the banjar and the fiddle, both played in highly rhythmic and energetic ways, became the instruments enslaved people would dance to. The banjar, the precursor to the banjo, is in just nothing else but a stringed drum recently, obviously, apparently. It's a stringed drum if you think about the body of a banjo. It's a gourd with a hide stretched over it like a drum with strings on it. And the banjo combined the revolutionary nature of the drum's rhythms with the fluid, fretless tones that matched the sliding quality of melodies produced by the human voice. And so from the 17th century on, black people played the fiddle and the banjo in America. We see a minstrel banjo player here on the left, and we see a depiction of music on southern plantations. And we'll talk about this a little bit more, if this is an accurate depiction or not. Um, uh, African-American people would adopt the European style violin and would, would develop the banjo into a more standardized five-stringed instru instrument, which is the banjo we know today. And if we think about the word banjar, the first syllable gives us the first syllable of the word banjo, and the second syllable, ar, gives us the second syllable of the word, of the word guitar. So it's a combination of those two instruments. 
Uh, European settlers brought their own musical traditions to America, and often in the case, as in the case of the Irish, Scots, Irish, Germans, Dutch, and French, the instrument that, that was the most expressive, the most widely played, but also, and maybe more importantly, the one that was small enough to be easily transported was the fiddle. And so all along the eastern seaboard, from Virginia through the Carolinas to Louisiana and Mississippi and westward into Appalachia, East Tennessee, southwestern Virginia, western North Carolina, black and white versions of fiddle music blended. White people on the southern plantations tremendously enjoyed the music of the black fiddle and banjo players. However, with the advent of concert houses in the cities of the north, music was presented on, a larger, on larger stages to larger audiences, as opposed to the informal plantation dances. And now it gets a little complicated. For reasons of perceived racial superiority, the white people had to contextualize the music differently so it could be enjoyed in ways that allowed white people not to identify with the black people who made the music. And so, beginning in the later 1800, 1830s and 1840s, white singing, playing, and dancing troops started performing as blackface minstrels. Blackface minstrels were white people, white singers, that blackened their faces with burnt cork, wore black wigs and tattered clothing, and sang the songs of the plantation slaves often depicting them as ignorant, slow-witted, and speaking in plantation dialect. There was one guy that we see here called Thomas D. Rice, a white man who perfected a routine that, that he called Jim Crow, a song and dance number that he supposedly had seen an old black man perform. He would become one of the best known performers of his time, even traveling to England to perform his blackface routine for royalty. Over here we can see him playing in front of the House of Lords in England. So popular was the Jim Crow name that it would be used, or probably um, better, the better term would be abused, to describe the discriminating laws between Reconstruction and the Civil Rights era. Blackface minstrel troops like the Virginia Minstrels commanded performance fees that were among the highest of the time. These grotesquely stereotyping performances were hugely popular in the cities of the Industrial North and were always performed by white men until in the late 1800s, some black performers, ironically also forced to wear blackface, would become part of these outfits. James Bland, the guy on the right here, was sometimes called the world's greatest minstrel man. He was a black performer and songwriter. He wrote a song called Carry Me Back to Old Virginia. We see the uh, cover of the sheet note music on the left here. Carry Me Back to Old Virginia wrongfully romanticized life on the southern plantation. The song would be the state song of Virginia from 1940 and wait for it till 1997. So we can see how difficult it is from today's perspective to untangle the representations and misrepresentations of black music and minstrelsy. Eventually, blackface minstrelsy, minstrelsy lost its popularity with the rise of vaudeville and the moving picture shows but also with the advent of the recorded music business in the 1920s. Charles Wolfe, a leading musicologist, says that in the 20s and 30s, quote, the record company segregated music into separate series, one designed for whites, the other for blacks. White rural music included fiddle bands, banjo tunes, sentimental songs, and a few religious pieces. Black music series were dominated by country blues and gospel. A black band playing something other than the blues did not fit into the stereotype. Consequently, few of them were recorded. Few recordings by black string bands survived. However, a few black string band musicians kept their traditions going. Joe and Odell Thompson were first cousins who lived near Mabane, North Carolina. Joe played fiddle and Odell banjo. They were rediscovered in the 1970s by young people who enjoyed folk music and they became very popular. Um, Joe Thompson was named a National Heritage Fellow in 2007, and together with Odell, he played at Carnegie Hall for the Folkmaster series. Let's see what Joe and Odell Thompson sounded like. And let's keep in mind, when we, when we listen to this music, we hear what fiddle and banjo duos sounded 200 years ago. From today's perspective, this is as close to the source of this music as we can get. So this is Joe and Odell Thompson playing a tune called Molly Put the Kettle On. So 
So that sounds somewhat foreign to us today, but we can definitely hear the direct um, parallels to bluegrass music. And so now after this detour, we come back to Rhiannon Giddens, the first lady that I want to talk about. Joe Thompson, the gentleman whose music we just listened to was her mentor. His influence on her became the starting point for her band, the Carolina Chocolate Drops, that we can see her. They won a Grammy for the 2010 album, Genuine Negro Jig. Let's listen to a little bit of what the Carolina Chocolate Drops sounded like and compare that to what you just heard before. This is them playing Sandy Boys. <laughs> playing music that's hundreds of years old, still as relevant as it was today as it was then, and that made them highly popular. As I have said before, Rihanna Giddens has studied classical voice at Overland College, and we may infer, we can imagine that opera is a musical style that brings a multi-ethnic African and Native American woman face to face with a complete lack of representation of her own identity. And so consequently, Giddens was who was then in her, in her early 20s, discovered this old-time music, which is typically transmitted in an oral way. It's not notated. It's passed on from one person to the other, which was a complete turn from the world of classical music. Giddens says, quote, we had each come to old-time music in different ways, but we all felt the huge import of having a black elder to learn from. Each of us was well used to being the only splash of color in any traditional music gathering, end of quote. And so Giddens and her bandmates, Justin and Dom, who all lived in Greensboro, North Carolina at the time, sought out Joe Thompson, who lived 45 minutes away in the Bay. In the oral tradition of passing music on to a new generation, they learned by playing by ear with Joe Thompson and Odell. This style of music must be felt, not analyzed. And this is how Giddens and her bandmates learned to play this music. Joe Thompson was also a fine singer, and Giddens talks about him sing singing the old hymn, Lights in the Valley. She says, I felt the spirit stir when Joe sang, felt connected in a visceral way to the ones who have come before. For me, Dom and Justin, Joe was our musical grandfather. He spoke and behaved in an idiom that we understood in a way we couldn't explain. The black experience was inseparable from the music we played and experienced in his presence. Giddens talks about the spiritual connection that we feel with people who express themselves in musical ways that we can relate to. And when we feel these connections, as you all know, we can reach transformative moments because music can point to what we can't say, it, be it in Handel's Messiah or in Joe Thompson singing Lights in the Valley. When Giddon says we all felt the huge import of having a black elder, what she's expressing is the need to overcome what the famous writer W.E.B. Du Bois called the double consciousness of the black experience, the sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. Joe Thompson showed Giddens how to look at the world of old time music through the black experience. And through her classical education, her interest in different kinds of old time music, but mostly through her intellect, Giddens arrived at the, at the conclusion that, quote, this idea of what is black, what is white, all of that is a moving target, and it's one of the biggest problems we have in the United States. As we've seen earlier in my overview of the origins of American old time music, this music had never been binary. It had never been black or white. It had always been black and white. And Giddens has shown us through her musical journey that music, especially American music, is never one dimensional, that music is never binary. In 2017, Giddens went on to make a highly acclaimed album called Freedom Highway. The centerpiece of the album is a Giddens original entitled Julie that's based on the true life story of an enslaved woman at the end of the Civil War. A white woman in 1865 at the end of the Civil War is pleading with Julie, her house slave, to stay with her as the Union Army approaches and to lie on her behalf. Giddens wrote this song in direct speech. She speaks as both the black and the white woman. Julie, oh Julie, won't you run? Because I see down yonder the soldiers have come. Julie, oh Julie, can't you see? 
Them devils have come to take you far from me. Mistress, oh mistress, I won't run, because I see down yonder the soldiers have come. Mistress, oh mistress, I do see, and I'll stay right here till they come for me. Julie, oh Julie, you won't go. Leave this house and all you know. Julie, oh Julie, don't leave here. Leave us who love you and all you hold dear. Mistress, oh mistress, I will go. Leave this house and all I know. Mistress, oh mistress, I will leave here with what family I've got left. They're all I hold dear. Julie, oh Julie, won't you lie if they find that trunk of gold by my side? Julie, oh Julie, you tell them men that that trunk of gold is yours, my friend. Mistress, oh mistress, I won't lie. If they find that trunk of gold by your side, mistress, oh mistress, that trunk of gold is what you got when, you, when my children you sold. Mistress, oh mistress, don't you cry. The price of staying here is too high. Mistress, oh mistress, I wish you well, but in leaving here, I'm leaving hell. The power of this dialogue is in the repetition of these individual lines. The white woman is pleading with Julie to help her and Julie replies to her by repeating and denying her requests. We can find this powerful literary technique in many Appalachian ballads of English backgrounds, where constant repetition by characters who represent different worldviews builds to a climax that often remains ambiguous in outcome. By the end of the Civil War, most enslaved black people in America had adopted the Christian faith and responded strongly to images of the exodus from Babylon, as evidenced in spiritual songs like Go Down Moses. This song here, Julie, is an extension of this. It's an exodus story of a different kind. Giddens borrows the literary techniques and musically modal character of these old songs and does something that's often frowned upon by traditionalists. She turns them into original songs that sound old and new at the same time, just like they sound black and white at the same time. And what's remarkable about what Giddens does is it's not only her understanding of the form and character of these old songs, which is a prerequisite for writing new songs within those idioms, but also that because of her diverse educational background, she has a natural way of giving herself permission to weave all her knowledge into something that's so progressive because it's so steeped in tradition. And more than that, actually, in different traditions. Innovation requires preservation, as I have stated. And the beginning of this studies and Giddens show this through her work. Giddens says, my work as a whole is about excavating and shining a light on pieces of history that not only need to be seen and heard, but that can also add to the conversation about what's going on now. Well, we may contextualize this quote with the Black Lives Matter movement, with the torturing to death of George Floyd and the systemic racism that permeates our, permeates our society. Giddens, without being moralistic, draws parallels from the past to the present. And through her work, she encourages all of us to explore our diverse backgrounds, to let diversity lead the way to true understanding of ourselves and of others. In 2019, Giddens wrote an opera called Omar about an African Muslim enslaved in America, and a ballet called Lucy Negro Ruidas by Carolyn Randall Williams, who's a Nashville-based poet. And again, by giving herself permission to work within all these different styles of music, she takes an artistic risk the risk of being viewed as someone who dabbles in too many different styles. But it's that very risk that she's taking that keeps her artistically healthy. It's what makes her stand out as a woman who represents bluegrass, old time, Americana, and classical music. And she does that in a way that urges all of us to look back while looking ahead, to see the commonalities of people by observing the commonalities of their music. I'd like to encourage all of you and all of my students to view music and all its cultural complexities as patterns of overlapping circles rather than branded genres. I personally shudder when I think about the origin of the word branded and how much of the music business insists on the branding of young artists like you. Giddens shows us that the opposite approach, an approach that embraces different styles of music, old and new, is not just possible, but it's actually a way to success and a way to artistic integrity and longevity. Giddens perfectly sums up, sums up her worldview, her agenda, as well as a simple yet true powerful description of the diverse nature of music and humanity overall. In the title of an album she made in 2019, There Is No Other. 
Now, let's go to Amethyst Kia, who was born in Chattanooga, Tennessee. She grew up in a suburban environment. Her family was one of a handful of black families. And some white parents were uncomfortable with their children playing with the child of a black family. So a sense of otherness was instilled in her at an early age. Her family also did not attend church, which led to Kia being an outsider within the black community as well. Coming out and identifying as queer was another factor that made her feel other. Her parents divorced when she was in her teens, followed by her mother's death shortly after. Kia then withdrew from most aspects of social life. And as songwriting students here know, when she discovered the guitar, she found a way to express herself in song. And this interest in the guitar and the power of song led to her studying in the old time bluegrass and country music program at East Tennessee State University. This program is a part of Appalachian Studies program at UTSU. Appalachia itself is a complicated issue. Uh, Appalachia is a culturally rich and diverse region that has been stereotyped as backwards, hillbilly, remote, inbred, and violent. Commercial country music has, has exploited the hillbilly stereotype that's associated with Appalachia for a long time, and it still does it to this day. Appalachian studies work to dispel these stereotypes, instead highlighting a culture that's rich in music, visual arts, literature, and ethnic diversity. Appalachians were not all white people of Anglo-Saxon or Scots-Irish descent. Rather, they came from a variety of backgrounds, from Germany, France, Holland, Poland, and Italy. And there is an often overlooked African-American contingent in Appalachia. Amethyst Kia was a shy, black, queer woman with an extraordinary singing voice, encouraged by a gentleman called Jack Cottle, one of the leading scholars in Appalachian studies. Kia learned about the importance of the banjo, its West African roots, and about its use in old time bluegrass music. She began playing the banjo and started writing songs that explain, explained her identity to herself and to the world around her. Kia says, for me, being black is quintessentially wary and strange. She expresses this sense in her song, Black Myself. This song was nominated for a Grammy Award in 2020 for Best American Roots Song. A close reading of some of, those import of the most important lines of this lyric will explain, I hope, why Kia is such an important new voice in old time and Americana music. Let's listen to a little bit of her wonderful, powerful song, like myself. assume that the narrative switches to the present day. She wants to sweep that gal right off of her feet, which, may, which we may take as a hint at Kia's sexuality, the freedom to love whomever she wants to love, which in the time of slavery she would not have had. 
alluding to the fact also that many white plantation owners abused black women frequently, since there was no way for the victims to complain or fight back. She's tired of walking around with no shoes on my feet, tired of being poor, being issued a certain number of clothing items, with shoes being one of the symbols of the upper ruling class. In the last line, she hints at the sense of righteousness white slave owners displayed as doing enslaved persons a favor by introducing them to the Christian faith, while at the same time insisting on the inferiority of the enslaved people. The line, your precious God ain't going to bless me, can also be interpreted as Kia's present-day frustration with, quote, the hypocrites who use Christianity to justify these actions. Perhaps one of the strongest musical elements of this song is the call and response line, I'm black myself. Call and response is a hallmark of field haulers, which were precursors to the blues. In field haulers, one person would sing a line and a group of people would repeat it or respond to it. These haulers provided a, a means to pass time, but also a rhythm to work to. And we find a similar mode of singing in the lining out of hymns in the white primitive Baptist churches of Appalachia, where the preacher or a lay person sings a line and then the congregation sings it back. Again, we find an astonishing parallel here between black and white music. The line on black myself creates a sense of community. Kia invites black, queer, and otherwise othered people to join in shouting out their frustration. The details of this song refer to Kia's blackness, but in a larger sense, they're also a commentary on the evolving term of blackness, and thus also a commentary on the evolving concept of otherness. In the first line of the chorus, Kia says, is you washed in the blood of your chattel? Kia switches to the grammar of plantation dialect here. The words are or were are replaced by the word is. Plantation, plantation dialect was misused in blackface minstrelsy to make fun of black people's of black speech. But Kia now uses that dialect, dialect as a mark of pride, as a linguistic connector to her ancestors when she again turns to the slave owners that use Christianity to defend slavery. She asks them if they were washed in the blood of their chattel. Chattel slavery being a form of slavery where a person is not only owned by another, but also the enslaved person's children in perpetuity. And as we have seen here, the word is can interpret it as were, but also as are, which puts the line into contemporary context, where all of us are asked if and to what extent our modern society is still permeated, permeated by systemic racism. That is a direct result of slavery, reconstruction, and Jim Crow law. So the use of the word is in this twofold way throws this line directly at our feet today. In the next line, Kia says, the lambs rotted away. That religious beliefs that condone racism and slavery contradict the teachings of Jesus. This line also says that the lamb at the sign of innocence has rotted away, that any collective innocence, if there ever was such a thing, is an illusion, which means that if we're not explicitly anti-racist, we're complicit in racism. In the next line, when they stop sh shipping work horses, here it refers to the end of the transatlantic slave trade in 1808, when a federal law was passed that rendered the import of enslaved people illegal. The following closing line of the chorus said, you bred your own anyway, refers to the shameful history of white plantation owners sexually abusing black women who had no way to resist and who were forced to birth the children of their abusers. It takes Kia only one verse and one chorus to present us with one of the most distinct expression of righteous anger by a black artist today. I don't think I'm overstating the importance of this song by putting it in a direct line with some songs that you may know, Billie Holiday, Strange Fruit, Nina Simone, Mississippi Goddamn, and Marvin Gaye's What's Going On. In the line, I picked the banjo up and you stare at me, here refers to the fact that some audiences still think it's strange to see a black person play the banjo, which of course is totally ironic since it's an instrument that comes from Africa. So from that we learn that the way listeners visually perceive an artist or a presentation influences what they hear. Audiences that are educated in the history of the banjo see something completely different when they see Kia or Giddens play the banjo than somebody who views the banjo through the lens of hillbilly stereotypes. In the next line, Kia may be switching to a narrative from a male perspective when she sings, you lock your doors when I walk by. She talks about the notion that has been cultivated over the past several hundred years 
that the black person, the other person, is the one to be afraid of, especially the black male. Historically, black males had been accused of being a threat to white women, which led to many, many lynchings. But in truth, the white male was a threat to the black female. All these layers and sub-layers of meaning are found in these lines that Amethyst here. In songwriting, we often call these types of lines loaded lines, loaded with different layers of meaning and ways of interpretation. I'm not at all saying that these layers of meaning are always consciously written by the writer. Frequently, these layers of meaning are a product of the subconscious, and they flow on the page in a stream of consciousness. The stream of consciousness is obviously informed by any writer's personal but also ancestral history. I encourage all my songwriting students, but all of you to do creative work, to make strong use of stream of consciousness. When we take this seriously, the results are often astounding to me in the context of songwriting, but even more so to my songwriting students. In the last line, Kia expresses a sense of feeling invisible. People look her in the eyes, but they do not see her. This line encourages all of us to look deeply into the personal history of our fellow men and into the eyes of history itself. So that ultimately we fully recognize whomever we perceive as the other, as our neighbor, whom we are as Christians commanded to love as ourselves. Kia says that the last verse is a kind of transcendence into a new plane where blackness is no longer a curse, but rather a source of strength. She states that she has been born brand new, another line with religious overtones, only this time in a positive context. She's been born brand new, in her, brand new in her blackness, in her otherness, in her acceptance of it, and in her willingness to fight against systemic racism. She closes this course by saying that there's still work to do. We know that there's work to do because that's why this song was written. That's why we listen to it. That's why it touches us. And that's why we're here today on Diversity Week. If music plays a deeper role than to be mere entertainment, which I believe it does, then this song perfectly sums up what Americana music needs to try to achieve. It should represent the American experience in all its details and in all its complexities. For Rhiannon and Amethyst, these are focal points of her work, of their work, for which I think we owe them a great deal of gratitude. We salute them for looking deeply into their personal histories and for connecting those to our collective history, and for pointing out that diversity is at the core of American culture. Giddens and Kia are generally more associated with Americana music. Sarah Hall is steeped in the tradition of bluegrass music. Since this study mainly focuses on the songwriting aspect of, of the, these three ladies, it's important to point out that while throughout the history of bluegrass, there were numerous female instrumentalists and singers that were great and of note, but there were only very, very few songwriters. From today's perspective, there was and still is a thematic gap in bluegrass songwriting, a lack of depth, a lack of desire and courage to expand the genre, musically and lyrically. There's a lack of introspection and exploration of heritage that reaches beyond the overused themes of home sweet home and lost and found love. So now we come to Sierra Hall. Sierra grew up in Birdstown, Tennessee on the Cumberland Plateau. She says, quote, growing up in the hills of Tennessee in a town of less than 1,000, there was a lot of bluegrass country folk and what I call church music. At the age of eight, Hall expressed an intimate interest in playing the mandolin. She took lessons from a neighbor. She learned a lot of instrumental tunes, tunes that are called Clock Old Hen, Angeline the Baker, Soldier Stroller, Temperance Wheel, and tons and tons of others. And she learned them all by ear. That's how we do that in that kind of music. Hall says about bluegrass jam sessions, the music is amazing. But this idea that you can be welcomed into a jam if you're nine or 90 is a beautiful thing. The sense of community expressed in these sessions, the sense that anybody who can pick is welcome to join in a small rural town, made a lasting impression on Hall, who says that Lucas has long been a style of music that community is at the center of, which is why I love it. Hall attended bluegrass festivals where her incredibly precise, rhythmically sharp playing caught the attention of some of the bluegrass genres greatest and most influential and successful players. Her playing was not just incredibly great for a 10-year-old, it was incredibly great for anybody at any age. When she was 11 years old, she was invited to perform on the Grand Ole Opry with her hero, Alison Krauss, the lady who won 27 Grammys, who had heard about and met Hall at festivals. 
At 14, she made her first record, and she became a star in the world of bluegrass music. Today, at age 31, she's one of the greatest mandolin players on the planet. In a musical world like bluegrass, where diversity has only become a relevant topic over the past 10 or 15 years, she has, in a fairly short time, come a very, very long way. Sierra realized that the world of bluegrass would always provide a musical home for her, but it became clear to her very soon that that home would be too small and too narrowly confined. Paul says, there's something really special about growing up in the same part of Tennessee where my grandparents grew up and their parents grew up, but it also means that in order to really get an idea of what it's like in the real world, you almost have to live there. Traditional bluegrass music and a home on the Cumberland Plateau became synonymous as a place that had to be left behind. And for Hall, it meant leaving for Boston to attend Berkeley College on a pre presidential scholarship under the uh, Obama administration. Coming from an oral education in bluegrass music, at first, Sierra was not sure how this academic approach would help her progress in her musical pursuits. She says, I suppose even I had a su suspicion that, that, that there would be a disconnect to study it in a classroom. But then I realized when I actually went to Berkeley that there were folks who truly loved and appreciated the music so much that they had listened, studied, and absorbed it as much as anyone I knew, even though they didn't grow up with it like I did. She goes on to say, more than having my ideas challenged musically at first, I'd say that I had brand new ideas introduced to me that I had previously been exposed to, and that was a beautiful thing. Sometimes you don't even know what all there is to learn until they're in a setting like that. I hope you have the same uh, feeling sometimes, or often. Right? When she returned from Berkeley, she was ready to express herself in new ways, musically and poetically. Paul says that the age of, at the age of 22, she found that she had a lot to say about personal growth, about the fact that to have your ideas challenged can be a very scary thing. She expresses these challenges on her 2016 album, Weighted Mind. Looking at some of the lyrics of the songs in Weighted Mind, we can see how elegantly and eloquently Paul expresses thoughts of challenging her cultural background, family structures, and matters of faith. My skin is old. I need to shed it, because there's more to me. I have to let it out. I may not know which way I'm headed, but I've got my sail. I'm going to set it. Or, it's a long road that I'm walking. It's a long time I'll be gone. If you won't go where I'm going, then I'll have to go alone. Choices and changes. I'm tired of trying to be someone else. Or, so go ahead and walk with anger and make this girl your only stranger. If love was unconditional, well, it ain't no more. Tell yourself that you know best and dwell with pride in your emptiness. So much for unconditional. So long. These verses are not directed to a romantic lover, but at Sierra's audience and at her family. These lyrics express an amount of self-reflection that had not been seen in bluegrass music before. Sierra knew that she might alienate some of her followers with these songs, but as her lyrics say, she took the risk of having to go alone. Not only did she challenge her audience lyrically, but this album was also a radical departure from the musical and sonic aspects of traditional bluegrass. The album did not feature a single song that resembles the traditional bluegrass sound played by a five-piece band. Rather, the whole album is simply simply hollow mandolin and vocals, accompanied by an upright bass. And her hero, Alison Krauss, provides harmony vocals on a few songs, as does, and maybe not surprisingly, Leanne and Gibbs. Paul displays an openness to a lifetime of learning that lies at the center of any artistically healthy person. Through her work, Paul pushed open the doors for other up-and-coming young songwriters and bluegrass, people like Molly Cuddle and Billy Swing. Now at the age of 31, there seem to be literally no technical limits to her virtuosity, and her open and inquisitive mind leads her to writing songs that defy genre boundaries. Let's listen to a little bit of her song, and then we'll have to conclude. <laughs>
Howard Sierra proves that innovation requires preservation. Once that mindset has been fully realized, artists like Hull, Giddens, and Kia, and artists like you, can move between and beyond confining genre lines, and the audience will follow. You observe here that the audience is a part of the music making. The audience doesn't simply constitute or confirm an artist's commercial success, it also confirms the artist's quest for new ways of expression. Artists and audiences become a part of an artistic expedition which the artists, to the artists carrying the torch. None of these three women are considered a part of, a part of any commercial musical mainstream, but their insistence, on, on their insistence on exploring new ways of expression, which ironically sometimes means exploring old ways of expression, gained them a loyal fan base that's interested in seeing what these women will present them with and challenge them with next. Through these women, the faces of bluegrass, acoustic music, and Americana music have changed for good. But more than that, the musical styles have been transformed from within through an inclusive look at tradition that explains the necessity of preservation. And through that, it has led to a focused way of musical innovation. Academia was a catalyst for the development of all these three artists. Giddens used her classical training to perfect her vocal technique. At the same time, she realized that she did not want to spend her life in the field of classical music. That realization led to her discovery of black string band music. Amethyst Kia found a connection to her ancestral oral tradition through academia. Through this connection, she found a way to express herself poetically and musically. Sierra Hall realized through academia how strongly rooted she was in the oral tradition and how much academia could show the way to new forms of artistic expression that did not deny the importance the oral tradition. Discovering, understanding, and connecting are at the core of any academic education. To me, as an instructor of songwriting, this means that I see it as a great responsibility to introduce my students to styles of music and ways of listening to music that may be new to them. I need to be, at the same time, open to letting my students introduce me to the music and artists that are new to me. That's the part of discovery. Then we explain to each other why this or that music matters to us. We look at the history of songs. We look at the development of styles of songwriting. We realize that the Memphis Jug Band in 1925 played music that is very similar to that of Kendrick Lamar today. We realize that ancient ballads from Appalachia talk about the same universal struggles that are as relevant today as they were 200 years ago. And we understand the importance of the songwriting history of music growth and our place in that long line of song. That's the part of understanding. And then comes the part of connecting. Connecting the dots on a map of the musical landscape to artistic expression and new research. And when we connect these dots, we'll hopefully find a new awareness of where all this music comes from, what it means, and where it may lead to. Hopefully we all add a couple of new dots of knowledge in this process. And we write songs. My students write their songs, and I write mine. And when we get to the heart of that creative and academic process, we hopefully all arrive at the conclusion that, as Rihanna Giddens said, there is no other. Thank you very much.